Welcome to the Futurist Society podcast, where we delve into the latest advancements in technology, science, and culture. From discussions on the latest breakthroughs in AI, biotechnology, and space exploration, the Futurist Society is your window into all the awesomeness that the future holds. Get ready to be informed and inspired as we consider the positive impact of emerging technologies on humanity. Without further ado, welcome your host, Dr. Awesome. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Future of Society, where we are broadcasting from the present but talking about the future. Today, we have Patrick Friedman, who is the founder of the Sea Setting Institute and currently general partner at Pronovos Capital and a technologist that I'm really excited to talk to you about because he went from the technology space and is now doing really interesting things with society and government and how we live as a species. So, Patrick, welcome to the program. Can you just tell us a little bit about you and how you got started with all of this? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Doc. I appreciate it. Um, I guess for me, it kind of it kind of started after college, where you know I, I have these kind of strong values of of freedom, and there's a lot of things about the U.S. that I didn't like. You know, whether it's the the wars overseas or the putting people in jail for what kind of plants they eat, and I just I didn't feel like I belonged. And it didn't seem like my views are popular enough that we could really affect change in a democratic system. So I was like, well, maybe I'm just in the wrong country. So I went and looked at some other countries. And I was like, well, they have different packages of goodness and okayness and terribleness, but like none of the packages is very good. So it, they weren't value aligned. And also most countries were just not very well run. Like you get better service from T-Mobile than the DMV, right? Like, uh, like not even like the best like cell phone company. And that just seemed really wrong. And so, you know, I've got some family background in economics and political science. And so I just got into researching it and trying to figure it out. I just came up with this idea, you know, I was in Silicon Valley and doing uh, doing a, a master's at Stanford and CS at the time and came up with this idea that like maybe the problem is there's not startups. Like we don't have ways to test out new political systems to make new uh, new countries for a smaller group of people. Um, and, and that's wrong. People should be able to band together um, around their own set of values and their own way of designing a government and go live it. And so we can see what works in practice instead of just talking about it, you know, in bars all the time in some like conceptual way. So that's what got me started. Yeah. So uh, the Seasteading Institute was something that I remember specifically the Colbert Report and the Daily Show talking about. And I saw that and I thought, that's a guy that is building the future. You know, he's pushing boundaries. And I'm so excited to talk with you because of that. Because I, I do agree with you, like government is something that really does not have a lot of new innovation. You know, I feel like there are definitely different forms of government, but I can't think of a, a new form of government off the top of my head that has been formed in the last however many years, right? So knowing that, like, what do you, what do you uh, looking at right now to, to make like the next step for us as government? Yeah. I mean, so, so what, what I kind of focused on for, for a long time, cause it was so hard is like, how do we have something like startup countries, you know, and first with the seasteading work, because in the early two thousands, no countries were willing to kind of work with groups to do governance experiments. Um, you know, but that changed in 2010, 11, when Honduras created their for this first charter city program, you know, uh, Paul Romer's famous TED talk in 2009. And the, the beautiful thing about a charter city is that it's this nice halfway point. So uh, a charter city kind of the default is it's got its own commercial law. Um, and it follows the country's criminal laws, their constitution, all of its treaties, which you have to do. And so it's like a big enough space that really, really matters. I mean, commercial law is like a lot of it. It's mm -hmm. still under a government. You've got them as, as a backstop. So it was this this uh, this awesome halfway point. And so, you know, it took 15 years or something, but eventually we got to where I can work on, you know, on your question, right? Instead of just how do we even make experiments possible? Um, you know, what do they do? And like what I'm in this for is wanting to see like brand new government systems that are really different and maybe find one that's as much better than constitutional representative democracy, which is like the current industry standard, as mm -hmm. much better than that as that was monarchy. Mm -hmm. um, that's my hope. But today, the product market fit 
is bringing the current kind of best practices Mm -hmm. um, to more countries. Because it's so hard for a country to like, I don't know, change their entire commercial law. And then people wouldn't want it, right? Like, I think it's wrong to change the law in a huge way on top of people. And that's why in the charter city concept, you start with empty land and people opt into it. And so, you know, what's happening with Honduras Prospera, for example, which is kind of our our zero to one, is that they looked around the world at all different areas of commercial law and who has the best legal system and put them all together into one kind of consolidate, consolidated, simplified, like this is best practices today. Um, yeah. And so that's kind of, you know, that's product market fit. But I would say I'm looking to the crypto world for like the new governance models. I mean, there's also people have had a lot of ideas for a lot of decades that they didn't get to put into practice. My dad actually designed one like really neat political system. He's kind of the co-inventor of uh, polycentric law. Um, but yeah, right now it's it's best practices and crypto is where all the governance experimentation is happening. I mean, one angle in my work is I'm trying to bring the fluidity of the digital realm, the ease of entry to making new things and the switching to the world of governments and cities and countries. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I really like what you said earlier about the fact that you get better service from T-Mobile than the DMV. I feel like civil service even is something that's ripe for innovation and increases in efficiency. And if you do that on the city level and you say like, listen, like our city runs better than all these other cities, like at least you can you know, start getting early adoption there. And that's when you can start convincing people like, okay, maybe the legal system needs to be reinvented. But so, so where are you at with that? Like, is it, are, are, have you, are you kind of searching for funding or you guys, do you have any model cities available? Like, like what are some, where, where are we at with your experimentation? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, in some one sense, we're really early. I think for people coming into this, we've gone zero to one with Honduras Prosper. There's kind of one of these like model jurisdictions. You know, my investment fund has funded about eight other companies, most of whom are trying to do the same thing. Some of whom are in, you know, pr- pretty far into negotiations with with governments. Um, but yet there is only one, and so people are like, "How does this work?" or "How does that work?" I'm like, "Well, we have one, but I can tell you my guesses." But for me, right, I've been working on this stuff for 20 years, and it was considered crazy. Right. Mm-hmm. Even like 10 years ago, you know, mm-hmm. we, we were being made fun of. And so for me, the fact that there is one and there's a bunch of countries interest is like, wow, it's like it's such huge progress. So I think our biggest barrier right now is founders is like great entrepreneurs, teams of entrepreneurs, um, ideally with some experience who are really passionate about some vision for a new and better way to live. Um, and uh, the, I think the most important thing beyond kind of general, you know, startup badassness is community building because look, you're going to start with a build for a hundred people or a thousand people who you're trying to get to move to some new place and try some new way of life. That needs to be like a really, really aligned and cohesive and bonded community. So that's really important. We actually, Mm -hmm. it's crazy, but like, like I get people offering to intro me to countries on a regular basis that I don't follow up because we don't have any founders like we we have there's a lot of countries interested because the world has changed and countries get that the 21st century is different at least small countries do uh so founders and i would say that capital is kind of like now in these market conditions capital is 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 a big constraint for sure especially some of the projects get bigger and are raising like larger build rounds um you know i like like to say that um like in these market times like we are not a flight to safety like sorry i think these projects will be profitable it's like my career to invest in them but you know it's not easy to convince someone who's just kind of scared about how the world is going even though our sector is doing great countries continue to be interested and projects are moving forward um but yeah it's a, it's a tough time to raise so founders number 1 and i would say capital number 2 but way, way behind number 1 so How's the city of Honduras doing? Like, like, what are you doing differently there than an, another city or, or even, you know, something that you've done in the past? Well, so it, it's actually, it's really interesting in Honduras. They've been operating for several years. They're, they're growing rapidly. Uh, they have some really neat businesses there doing gene therapy, drone delivery, like customized houses, like apartments that you design and like a web app in conjunction with Zaha Hadid. But they're now running into some significant uh, like political trouble um, where the government of, that ran Honduras from 2009 to 2021 was in favor of this program. It was something really important to them. Um, but in late 2021, 
there was an election that that swept in a, a, a far left candidate um, and they like really don't like the program. It's like a campaign promise to try to stop it. Now, it was always expected in these projects that you need to have legal protections so that if you make a deal with government and invest a lot of money and try to create jobs, um, they're not able to just break that agreement or expropriate what you've built. And so um, Prospera has various legal protections. Um, there's investor treaties uh, with, with the US and there's the Central American Free Trade Agreement, CAFTA, which Honduras is part of. And you know th there can be serious sanctions or damages against them um, because the program, the, when they made the program, the constitutional amendment, it specifically said that existing projects were grandfathered in, right? Otherwise nobody would do one of these or, or build it. Um, so they're trying to, you know, trying to say that that's invalid and Prospera has initiated arbitration um, against Honduras to say like, hey, you need to stick to your agreement. And it's kind of in limbo. But the great thing is they're, they've been able to keep operating normally through all of this and, and, and keep growing. So, you know, it's 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 kind of troublesome, but I think they're in a they're in a pretty good, pretty good shape. And, you know, there there have been, you know, there's various US lawmakers. Um, kind of weighing in on both sides of this. Um, you know, there's those who say like, hey, if we just let countries break their investor agreements with us, that's like terrible for US investors. Um, you know, it's, it's like not okay. And like, they're, like, why are we giving aid, for example, to countries that break their agreements? And then there's others who say, um, oh, these investor relation treaties are like terrible and they harm poor countries. And so it's kind of, it's kind of playing out. But Prospera, like I said, they put together this this really uh, like best practice legal system. Um, they're an incorporation jurisdiction. They're working on becoming a cryptocurrency jurisdiction. Um, yeah, they're just they're doing a lot of things uh, in 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 new ways, and and people there are, you know, are really happy to be there. So, how did it go with the C based locations? Because one of the things that I was always attracted to is just the fact that like nobody's really tried what you have tried, which is creating your own islands, creating your own jurisdictions purely on the sea. Um, you know, it always harkens back to me, the idea of Jules Verne's 20,000 leagues under the sea. This is like yeah. a completely self-sustaining ecosystem that was created by man to live in the sea, which we really have not tried. So I feel like it was a a, a double experiment, which is the government system, but then also this idea of like living in a location that we really haven't tried before. So how did those go? Yeah. I mean, it, I think it turns out to be really hard and there's a few things that are working. Um, you know, I think that ocean is kind of expensive and difficult enough that you have to be really selective with what you do, where, and with what business model that there's only a few things that can work. I, I think the the amazing that what seasteading was really good at was lighting up people's imaginations, whether it's like, mm -hmm. wow, we need new countries or, you know, Siva Gobert, like this is ridiculous. I mean, you know, we re literally got the word out to millions of people like, hey, why can't we start our own countries? And so that was amazing. And, you know, it's been uh, used in video games, in board games. Um, there's there's a number of like fiction novels, like it, it was incredible for that. Um, and in terms of what's been built, um, well, this is the, the sort of exciting is um, these these two people, uh, Chad and Nadia. Chad is a, a Bitcoin guy. Nadia is Thai. They're a couple, and with a German engineer's help, they built like this the their first seastead design um, off Thailand, and it's uh, it's a single spar seastead, meaning that there's like a pillar in the middle, a platform on top, and then flotation underwater, um, kind of like a dumbbell but with a really long uh, part in the middle. It's actually a design that like I suggested 20 years ago. It's just, it's pretty obvious. It's like the smallest thing you can make. Um, and the Thai Maritime Authority was totally cool with it when they asked. But after being out there for a month and uh, we at the Sea Setting Institute were filming all this, making a documentary, um, the Thai Navy heard about it. And Chad and Nadia had talked about someday we want to live free on the ocean. We want like sovereignty. And that's not what they were doing. It was just a test of the first prototype of an engineering design. Um, but, you know, Thailand did felt that this threatened their national interests and they charged Chad and Nadia with treason. What? Um, Chad and Nadia managed to get word and go into hiding. Thailand launched Operation Destroy Seastead. They sent three Navy boats and like 100 people to like, take like drag it in and destroy it. 
Um, and Chad and Nadia were in hiding for a while in Thailand, eventually made this daring nighttime escape by sailboat where they first went to Malaysia. And Malaysia was like, nope, you can't stop here. You can't even resupply. We side with Thailand. Um, and they had to go a week without enough like water or fuel. Uh, oh crazy God. thing. You can see some of this on, on this the YouTube series, uh, The First Seasteaders. But after that, I mean, they got out. It's awful, but it was OK. <laughs> they went to Panama, a friendly jurisdiction. And there's a whole community of, of people working on blue economy projects. And they've taken that prototype and made a production version that they're now selling called the, the Ecopod. Um, it's this, you know, beautiful fiberglass thing. It's, it's got, you know, it's got solar energy. It's, it's self-sustaining. And the nature of the design is it's much slower to move from point A to point B than a boat but it's much, much more stable in the waves. It doesn't move very much. So if you want to take it out someplace and anchor it, that's what it's made for. So they're selling these and that's pretty exciting. And I think if we have a community of these, there's various places on the ocean uh, where it's it's in international waters, but shallow enough to anchor that a group could go and start a community. More recently, um, Liberland, uh, which is this kind of micronation in, in, in Europe on land that two countries say is not theirs, um, Liberland and, and some of their people have, have done uh, a barge in international waters, um, I think, uh, near Iran. 12 miles out is the same as being in the country. And then 200 miles out is the economic zone where they regulate any using resources, fishing, scientific research, a bunch of stuff. But they chose a place where the countries don't claim an economic zone. And so you only need to be 12 miles out. And they anchored a barge. They live there. Their tugboat got the barge did great in some big storms. Unfortunately, their their supply boat got destroyed, and they had to turn to uh, to fishing, which was fine. They they did a lot of fishing, and uh, you know, and and were able to eat enough. And they're now looking to expand that project and bring more people out to live there. So there's some cool experiments happening. And I guess, <laughs> you know, I focus on the on the successes, but it's all of this is showing like. The frontier, it's exciting. It's a wild ride, right? Like sometimes the government comes to destroy what you build. Yeah. Um, sometimes you run out of food and have to just eat fish. You know, it's uh, it's pioneer life. Yeah, no, it's it, when you talk about the frontier, I think like oftentimes when I watch like a Wild West show, I'm like, why would anybody do that? You know, like why would you risk setting up in front of all of these hostile environments, but there's definitely a person out there like that. And we need people out there like that. I'm just not one of those people. It's exciting to see that, you know, from a, from a bird's eye view. Um, but I do hope that these kind of experiments do trickle down and really have downstream benefits for us as society, because right now we're in a very stale version of society in the midst of all of this rapid technological change. And I don't know if like those governments or any of these other places are as adaptive enough to handle these things. And I hope that we can at least get some, you know, experiments going that show us, okay, maybe, maybe we should adopt this model of the DMV, or maybe we should adopt this model of an economic system, you know, it's, it's really just like you said, cryptocurrency is, is one of these things that I think kind of open the door for a lot of these different, like everybody thinks is finance as like the, the one way to do thing, the, something like the dollar bill that's in your hand, or, you know, this international credit system we have. And now I think everything is looked at with this lens of like, okay, can we make it better? Can we do a better thing of that? And that's an exciting future because Hopefully, some of those downstream effects will affect us. Um, have you gotten any sort of like benefit from your own life from some of these experiments? I mean, obviously, like you know the the thrill of this experiment aside, what are some things that you've seen that like okay, this is going to benefit not only me but humanity down the road? Yeah, it's a great question. First, I want to say, give yourself credit. You may not be the guy who wants to go live out there, but you're exploring the frontier of ideas and of what mm -hmm. the human future is. Um, and that's, that's also rare and important. Um, so yeah. Well, like I appreciate that. I mean, I, I, I just, I like talking to interesting people like yourself and, and hearing about what 
is in store for us. You know, I think that that's something that that uh, really any type of science fiction has kind of hypothesized, and and that's something that I really enjoy. But but just tell me a little bit more. Like, what have you what have you seen in your own life, and like some benefits yeah. down the pipeline for the rest of society? In my own life, I mean, obviously there there's there's simple things like giving me a, a purpose of something amazing to do to serve humanity. But I'd say that there have been some really unexpected, um, like psychological benefits is that I, I kind of started out as a more like, these are my morals and they're like absolutely right. And everyone should believe them kind of person, which is, I don't know, I think it's like not healthy. It's not flexible. It's not like mentally diverse. And I think there's some moral principles that are pretty absolute and others that are more personal, personal preference. Um, and for me, kind of, thinking about starting new societies and the idea that a group of people with a given set of values should be able to come together to try to make a society around those values and then be tolerant of all of these. Like other people can think different. I think part of it is in a democracy. I'm like, if everybody has different values than me, I'm not going to get to live my values. And like, and that's terrible. But if, if groups of people can go live their values, then I don't need to convince them. It's, it's okay. Like that creates tolerance. Um, because we, we don't we don't all, all have to agree. And there's a sense in which democracy is very, very intolerant. Like sometimes the majority chooses to protect the minority, but it's still ultimately like up to the majority to, to decide. And the other thing is that the possibility of creating new societies, um, you know, it means that that I might have a values aligned society. And the lens of looking at countries like products, like these are products, places to live with values and legal systems. And I'm a I'm a customer, a citizen customer, and I'm really disappointed at what the products are. Like they're really bad. They don't fit me and they're and they're not well designed. And like, okay, how can we build better products? And the psychological difference between that, like I'm frustrated, the low quality and lack of choice versus like no country wants people like me. They're all so evil. Like it's this huge difference from this kind of like zero sum frustrated to this positive sum optimistic. And I think that makes a big difference psychologically. And I've seen a lot of people who have this, you know, moral absolutism or just hate the society that they're in. Um, and it, it makes them really, really unhappy. So, you know, I think that this view is really important. And and for society, like government is the largest sector of the global economy, meaning the percentage of global GDP that's spent on government is bigger than energy or transportation or healthcare, any of those things. Mm -hmm. It's really important. It's the base of our operating system. It's what everything else runs on. And there's mm -hmm. there's no innovation. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like I love the American Constitution. I, I think it's incredible, you know, but it's from 1787. We can do better now. I really appreciate that because if we don't have people that are experimenting with the different kinds of government, then we're just going to be relegated to what we have right now. And I feel like that's, that's fine, but in science fiction, they have this concept. Or I, I think it actually might be uh, fact or, or theory, or because I heard Michio Kaku talking about it on uh, another podcast a, a few weeks ago, and he was talking about like the different stages of civilization, and you know the first stage of civilization, uh, well, the, the zero stage is you know we have all of these individual tribes, and eventually when we get to stage one of a society or a civilization it's just like a monoculture or you know a mono government or something like that like and and we are seeing that today right like like whether we you know agree with it or not english is becoming the global language whether we agree with it or not there's certain art styles or culture styles that are rising to the top at a faster clip than others and there is a potential there i think to to become like a monoculture, just like, you know, like uh, what science fiction has talked about. Um, like, for example, Star Trek, right? Like Star Trek, you have one government, right? And I think that I would hope that there's somebody out there that's like you, that's like, you know, at least trying to test the system a little bit to make things better. Um, but right now, I feel like we are on this trend of one government and, you know, one. Uh, um finance system which is the american dollar and you do have like small sectors that are kind of pushing back against that but i it, the trend is that we're going in in a 
a monoculture or mono government type of system. Um, how do you feel about that? And and do you feel like that that's something that maybe I'm naive in saying because there are people doing things like you. There are the rise of other government systems. You know, China is getting big on the world stage. So obviously, like the idea of democracy isn't necessarily the end all be all when it comes to this stuff. Do you feel like that's an accurate assessment, or do you feel like I'm I'm looking at it inaccurately? Well, I mean, I yeah, I do think that like the the universalizing thing. Um, is like that's a powerful force and and from my perspective it's it's awful absolutely terrible for humanity because it's the opposite of what i was just describing like t- like tolerance comes from getting to do things your own way and then if other people want to do things a different way it's it's okay um and experiments means like it's not an experiment unless it's being done differently and so i think that um that diversity of governance and the ability to create new things that are really autonomous is is super important. Um, you know, and there's there's things where we need global coordination, right? Like existential threats, things like nuclear weapons. You know, I'm not saying don't have global coordination, but yeah, I'm really into the idea of like robust and and diverse governments. And I kind of see like the universalizing tendency, like everybody has to think our way, everybody has to have our same set of values, everybody should run on the same representative constitutional democracy. I, I see that as super harmful. I mean, you'll appreciate this, um, you know, since you're into, into science, I think of it a bit like uh, the second law of thermodynamics and the fact that um, entropy is always increasing and that um, eventually we're, we're, we're going to end up in like a completely like gray universe where like everything is the same and nothing flows and there's no life to me that's what the universalizing force is it's like trying to move towards everything being the same and like nothing flowing and no life so to me it's it's harmful but i I don't think it's like guaranteed or absolute i mean i love china existing not that i want to live there or that i think it's like a form of government that fits my values but it's truly different and it mm-hmm. works. And I think that's super, super valuable. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, not only is it different, but I would say that uh, that Russia is different and kind of works, but it's not like new, right? We, you know, we know that sort of uh, authoritarianism and oligarchy, like that's an old thing. But China, is, it's different and new and it works. So I love that. And I think that there is, um, I don't know, you, you look at something like like Brexit, um, that there's big downsides to to universalizing and and people people realize over time sometimes that's not the best thing and there's very strong national and regional identities um you know like the united states is is kind of always going to do things differently than than china and and then europe so you know i don't i don't think yeah or even in the united states we do things differently you know like there's a huge difference between certain regions and you know obviously there's a huge political division in this country you know so so there's Mm -hmm. i i feel like there is a give and take when it comes to diversity of thought and things being a little bit more homogenous like there's always a give and take like like for example if you know i look the way that you uh, described it was the second law of thermodynamics i look at it as like that bacteria in your gut right like (laughs) i have a medical background diversity of a gut flora leads to a healthier lifestyle, but in a starvation setting, right? Like there's certain things that are benefit from a monoflora that might be able to to gain to extract more nutrients from uh, from a certain type of food source or something like that. But regardless, I, I I think it's just interesting to watch it play out. You know, like right now there's this interesting change in humanity. I feel like everybody can kind of sense it. You know, like there's just so much change happening so fast and you know that that to me is really interesting to talk to people like you and just to see yeah like what what's going on with this change like where are we headed as a species where do you see you know uh what you're doing in in 10 years what what is something that that you're gonna hope from the the seasteading institute or or even your your city in honduras what are what are some things that you hope to to, that are going to happen at first, I just want to enthusiastically agree with you. Like we're in a time when there's this like rapid technological change. And that means that our old systems and institutions are breaking. They're they're not adapted. And we need to rebuild lot, large parts of civilization. I mean, I, I think of my project, I mean, my focus is governance, but being situated in this wider space of people who are seeing this system is broken. 
Let me rebuild it better and try it out myself. I mean, that's what Bitcoin is. We don't like fiat money and inflation, build our own currency and use it. And people are, you know, broader crypto is trying to do that with finance. Um, and there's other people doing it with education and healthcare and other things. So like, it's kind of like the, like a, a builder's paradise right now because so much is broken. There's so much to rebuild, but also it sucks to live under a broken system. Um, so I'd say for me in 10 years, I mean, I, I want more charter cities in more countries and, and more continents um, that are growing and that are different from each other. I want diversity. And 10 years is about my goal for looking at starting the first startup sovereign city state. So going from these charter cities within a, within a country to having enough experience and respect, influence and capital to start something, maybe it's on the ocean, maybe it's done with a country with permission um, that's actually aims for sovereignty. You know, in my space, there's people who like think you can hack sovereignty, like, you know, something like the Principality of Sealand, where like they had some letter from England saying you're not in our jurisdiction. They're like, yay, now we're sovereign. I, I think of it much more practically like an engineer, like when you have a population that's bigger than 20% of countries and an economy that's bigger and a military that's bigger, now you're like, hey, we're bigger than these countries, recognize us. So I would think it really comes from like building up, um, but doing something with starting to do projects with sovereignty as the goal. That's what I want to mm -hmm. get to. Yeah, that's really cool. That's really interesting to think about. I don't really know too much about this space. Like has, has there, like what would be the most successful representative example other than your guys' organization? Because what I think about, um, you know, I think of like the Wild West, and you move to an area and then you try to build up your town and eventually it gets to become, you know, some ghost town that doesn't really succeed or it could become the next, you know, uh, Salt Lake City. Right. Like like what are some other like representative examples that you could say that like, OK, like this might not be a Salt Lake City, but this is this these people are doing big things. I mean, well, if you go to the past. I think Amer America is this shining, shining example, which is why yeah. it's so frustrated when Americans are like, what do you mean start a new country? Right. Because right? it was like it, it was this frontier. Um, I mean, like you know. like recent, like modern, modern society, like post World War II, anything out there so that you can think of? It is Israel is one that that's oh, put yeah. forth, you know, and I mean, it kind of shows how hard sovereignty is because it took a huge amount of support um, mm -hmm. from larger countries and they still, you know, had to fight. Um, but that's. I'd say kind of the main example of a, of a startup country um, yeah. in, in recent history. Yeah. Um, I didn't even think about that. And then there's like the number of countries keeps growing and growing. So we have this kind of trend of like territories, for example, becoming independent. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they're, they're not really based around. I mean, I would say that Israel not based around a new way to live, but based around a specific way to live and a specific mm -hmm. set of values. So that yeah. was a values based um, but but there aren't there aren't very many of them. I think this is a really new idea because it's it's 21st century in nature. It's more fluid. It's more like the internet where you can just like start a new app really easily, where you can switch between things. It's saying, hey, in the real world of the jurisdictions, let's be able to start new cities, new societies, and 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 new countries. Um, and you know, we look to certain models. So uh Dubai actually pioneered this um kind of charter city zone, although mm -hmm. theirs was done by the government, not by a public private partnership. Mm -hmm. And they created their financial center, which had all of its own commercial law. And so they wanted to make a financial center. Their kind of Sharia based legal system was just really not good for that. And they said, okay, our product is a financial center. It's important that that product have good tech, good laws. And they looked around, and they said, London, they have really good financial regulations. They copied the laws of London based on it in English, in a country where all the other laws were in Arabic. Um, they hired retired British judges, and they created this zone, Dubai International Financial Center, that had this totally different commercial law. And if you incorporated within it, um, you would get that law like a, as a corporation um, wherever you were. And so they kind of pioneered what Honduras later did of saying, hey, this zone has different commercial law. And then, you know, remember I talked about values alignment and quality of government. 
Singapore is the the shining example in the world of quality Absolutely. of government. It's just incredibly well run. Yeah. You know, I think it's like somewhat tough to emulate. I've I've come to think that, you know, reading Lee Kuan Yew's biography, that Singapore had this really strong founder effect, like Steve mm-hmm. Jobs and and Apple. Yeah. Um, where part of why it's so good is it had yeah. an incredible founder for a really long time. But mm-hmm. it shows that government can work much, much better um, yeah. than it does in most countries. Yeah, I mean, I look at him as like that shining that 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 shining example of a benign dictator, right? And that model has like this scary annotation to it. But like honestly, you need somebody like that to get the stuff done that needs to be done. And it's not easy to set up a city state. And yeah. especially when you're dealing with like large amounts of people, you know, there's that number of humanity that if you go past 150 people, that's when social uh structures tend to break down because that's what we're used to is we're used to this number of like 150 people in our tribe right i never really thought about those countries like for whatever reason i thought you know okay they've existed for a long time but they really happen in the grand scheme of things you know yeah I, it's something that's that's really interesting to think about um let's talk about the other side which is like the failed experiments you know you mentioned sea land right like um the off the coast of of England, which I know about, but uh, just to, you know, for those of you guys who aren't familiar, like it's this uh, group of people that that struck off from the co- course of England. And I think it was like an oil refinery, correct? It was a an anti abandoned anti aircraft like radar platform. Gotcha. Yeah. So like like how big did that place get? And you know how big are you? How big are you guys in Honduras right now? You know, because because I look at like if you can get past that 150 number. Then I'm like, okay, something's working here, right? Yeah, it's really interesting. And you know, I talked to the people involved, and basically, it it was for pirate radio. There was this period in England, I think, um, definitely like the early '60s, maybe like the late '50s, where there was, you know, BBC One, Two, Three, and Four were the radio stations, and they didn't play any rock and roll, right? And you had like like the Beatles was happening, and you couldn't hear it on the radio, and so this created this demand, and all these pirate radio stations, most of them are on boats. But Sealand was one that was on a platform and they got all of the audience, of course, because they are the only ones playing the music that people wanted to listen to. And then the UK started to, to crack down on them. Um, first, they they made it illegal to advertise. Uh, and that was their, you know, for anyone in the UK to advertise. And that was their main source of revenue. They made it illegal to resupply. And so they would have to go to the Netherlands to resupply. But what eventually uh, killed it was they opened up the airwaves. And started playing rock and roll, which is a really neat example because I, I think some people would think of that happening or happening with a charter city as like failure, but that's narrow. The goal isn't to build charter cities. The goal is to serve humanity by making government work better. And so what what those pirate radio stations did is they forced the government to do the right thing and play what people wanted to listen to. And that's that's success. Um, And, you know, we look at, say, Hong Kong as an example, where the example of Hong Kong for China uh, and Shenzhen and everything that happened there lifted more people out of poverty than has ever been done before in history. It's like half a billion people, uh, which is absolutely incredible, you know, from having this model and all these people who went to Hong Kong and learned about, uh, you know, entrepreneurship and and free trade and, and brought it back. So, you know, that's an incredible thing that um, that we want to do. Uh, as far as Prospera, there's about 100 people living there. That Basically, it's been like constrained by raising money and building real estate. So they have mm-hmm. a bunch of real estate that is that is rolling out soon. Um, they, they have these four uh, like 12 to 14 story multifamily towers that, mm-hmm. that are opening soon. Um, and so that's going to expand it by hundreds of people, mostly Hondurans. Um, mm-hmm. you know, who, who either work in the zone, uh, or, or just want to live there. And then they're also, uh, building kind of higher end residences that would more likely be for, for expats for a smaller number of them. So they have a bunch of real estate rolling out. And so, you know, like it's going to be up to hundreds of people later this year. And I could see them hitting a thousand, I don't know, by end of next year. Maybe, wow. maybe middle of next year. So it's so. It's what does the government fast. look like right now over there? Like, what are you doing differently than the the Honduran society outside of the city? Yeah, I mean, so it's got completely different commercial law. And for those who don't know, commercial law is it's it's huge. It's it's most laws. It includes things like zoning, uh, 
financial market regulation, medical regulation, contracts, corporate law, um, family law, um, you know, labor law. It's like almost everything that's not uh, a crime. And so it's 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 most of the areas of law, and they've got you know their own commercial law system that was approved by the Honduran regulators when they rolled it out, and then they've got independent courts. Um, so they're using uh, international arbitration because it's a lot easier than building your own court system. There's a whole network of people out there whose job is to be judges. Uh, so it's got a separate court system than than Honduras, and it's yeah, it's a way of of kind of of trying something different. And, and of course, the the culture is also different in the sense that you know they're very entrepreneurial and and appealing to whether it's Hondurans who are entrepreneurial, um, you know, and want to want to work hard, move up the ladder, and better themselves or global nomads um, who are entrepreneurial and want to go live like in it with a government that is responsive to them kind of appeals to those forward thinking people. So when you say responsive to them, um, like let's say the civil services, like how is Prospera different, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, yeah, like, as what an is, example, what is, a, what is better in the Prospera experience than other societies? Yeah, it's, it's really neat, you know, because they're able to modify their commercial law too. So I was just at a, a longevity focused uh, event last week, and there's a bunch of people there who are interested in places to like create and deliver novel medical treatments, anti-aging treatments, stuff that would take, you know, 10 years and a billion dollars in the US. And in Honduras, like they actually have the ability to write their own medical regulations. And there is one neat gene therapy startup there, Mini Circle, that's that's operating. Um, I'm thinking of getting, uh, I'm looking at, at a few of their treatments, considering for myself. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's, it's incredibly unusual. I mean, you can do this in some smaller countries, but if you have a company um, or a group of companies in a space that would benefit from different regulations, they can go to Prospera and say, okay, here's what we're trying to do. Um, here's why we can't do it you know, in, in the U S cause it's so onerous. Now let's work out a set of regulations that will keep people safe while also allowing innovation that has a better balance of that. And, and Prospera can actually, can actually do that. Um, and, you know, you, small countries are starting to be willing to do this, uh, do this as well, but it's a very unusual thing in the world that you can just talk to regulators and kind of make, make new regulations. Mm, you know, yeah. if you're not some giant fortune 500 company or whatever. Right, right. Yeah, no, I, I think that certainly if you have the resources of a Fortune 500 company, a lot of these things are not really an issue. But if you're a small group of people, it's nice to you know know that there's other people that are trying to create these environments so that you can also have the, the same um, opportunities. Um, yeah. cool, I mean, I, I'm well, getting to talk to heads of state about changing the regulations. I have companies that are getting to talk to heads of state and I have friends who's, who for their own companies, you know, these are all like relatively small groups and small companies. They're getting to talk directly to countries and say, hey, here's the benefit we could bring to your country if you um, modernize your laws for cryptocurrency or for medical regulation or, or whatever it is. So it's mm -hmm. a really exciting time. Yeah, no, I, I think that it would, it's going to be interesting to see you know, how that plays out. Um, and I'd love to have you back in a year and see how Prospera has done in a year. Um, but we are getting to the end of our time. So I did want to talk with you um, a little bit about some things that have been brewing in my mind during this stimulated conversation. Um, you know, certainly the the three questions that I ask every guest uh, are at the end are things that I've been thinking about, and I don't have the opportunity to expand them uh, upon them when we're having conversations. So the first of which we kind of alluded to a lot of sea-based things. And I, that was really one of the things that I, I really liked about the Seasteading Institute is that it was this idea that we could go and colonize this place that that hasn't uh, really been colonized before. And the reason why is because I was really inspired by Jules Verne and 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. What is some media, science fiction or not, that really inspires you when you're thinking about these things that you look at as like, oh man, that would be so awesome if it was like this. Yeah. Um, so Snow Crash was one, um, you know, in, incredible book. This, the, 
They had these things called franchise-owned quasi-national entities. It's a world where the U.S. government is kind of faded into irrelevance, but there are these private organizations that have their own little gated communities all over the country that all have the same set of laws, the same set of court enforcement. In fact, the same like physical layout. So that if you move to like a, one in a different place, you like get the same layout. Um, you know, so so that was really neat. There's a book called The Syndic about a, a completely kind of like anarchist world, anarchist in the sense of peaceful cooperation without government um, that gets some, like a, a country tries to invade them and the way that like without any government, but with like pure cooperation, they're they're able to, uh, to repel them. The Moon is a Harsh Mistress by Heinlein. That's an amazing one. Um, the idea of creating this just like totally free society. I, I actually have a collection. In my living room, I have a collection of libertarian utopianist fiction yeah um there's a lodge of wayfaring men is a christian focused uh -huh. one about creating a community there's a lot they're really fun cool nice so so the the other one that i feel like i wanted to ask you at the beginning but i didn't get the opportunity to is uh so you're wearing the ears right now is, is that like uh is that part of the microphone or is that just like is that like your style or I'm doing a 30 day cat ear challenge. Okay. I was wondering about that. I, I didn't want to like be rude and just be like, dude, what's up with the ears? But I'm glad we at least address the elephant yeah. in the room. Cool. So hey, how, like is that for, try it, like, man. for charity? Is Maybe it for charity it. or no, it's more like it's more like a personal growth thing. Oh, okay. Right. To like be like a little visibly different in a way that's like fun and just yeah. kind of see how that affects interactions and conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think I think that um, one of the science fictions that I really like uh, that I, I really see like ourselves trending to is this graphic novel that came out called Private Eye. And people get to the point where they're just it's like, you know, in a video game, like they just wear masks and they wear, you know, whatever, because once you go outside everything is recorded everything is facial recognition and i look forward to that that time where like fashion is a head to toe idea you know like you you're dressed in your suit of armor and like you could be whatever you want you could be an octopus you know i look forward to that uh reality um so so kudos to you for for pushing the boundaries a little bit Thanks. um so last question um you know with everything that you're doing if everything goes right, what do you hope from your city state? What is it going to look like if everything goes right? Like you have that idea that, okay, it, in 10 years, I want to have my own city state. What does that look like for you? One thing is I, I want there to be multiple ones that are really different. And I've one thing that I've learned in this process is this humility of saying, like, I think I know my values and I, I have some ideas about how to design a government but I could be wrong about either of them. And it might be that if a bunch of different groups put their values into practice, I'll, I'll see that someone else's values are actually better or someone else's design is better. So, you know, I'm, I'm wanting a city state for myself that's really high freedom where the government is very efficient. Uh, another thing that I've realized is that how I used to think I cared about really low taxes and really small government. It actually turns out that's because most governments just waste money and do a poor job. Um, in places like Singapore, like if there's if there's higher taxes and spending and it's used really effectively, right, to create infrastructure, to foster entrepreneurship, to educate people, then that's actually that's actually fine. And so like what matters to me is, yeah, like how effectively does the government run? How does it balance kind of central planning with individual autonomy and creating a place that keeps people safe while while permitting freedom? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I. I... I feel like what you're saying is like, you just want it to be a benefit to society. You just want it to happen and be good for humanity. And I, I really um, appreciate that um, because you don't care what it looks like just as long as it achieves this goal that you've set out for yourself, which is really cool. It's vision um, versus engineering, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. the engineering is, it's not the point. The point is a great place to live. Mm -hmm. That's awesome, man. Well, listen, it was so nice to talk to you. I really appreciate having you on. I'd love to have you back in a year and we can see what, what has changed in Prospera. That is our time today. So Patrick, thanks so much for, for joining us. This is Dr. Awesome signing off from the Futurist Society. And I hope to see you all again or hear from all of you again 
in the future. Thanks, guys. We appreciate you taking part in today's episode. Take this chance to reimagine a better future by joining a community of futurists who strive for a remarkable world. Be a part of this growing network and contribute to making the world a more positive place. Visit thefuturistsociety.net and subscribe to the show so you don't miss a drop of hopeful futurism.